Hello people, you're yeah, welcome to Pro Masterclass. My name is Tola T.A. Alabi. And in today's class, I want to take some time to um, talk about some thoughts I've been having um, concerning our esteem as human beings. And I, I've said it in one of my previous classes that your esteem as a human being is one of the most valuable things that God has given you. Your esteem is one of the most valuable things. If anything tramples on your esteem, then you need to do your best to do away with those things, or with that thing, or with that person. Anything tramples on your esteem. Your esteem is the core of who you are. And it dictates how you operate and how effectively what you do is perceived. Your esteem is a very crucial force in your life. It's the fuel through which you are able to express yourself confidently. So nothing should ever rob you of your esteem. Nothing. And um, today I want to talk about three things. Three things we as human beings usually engage in that robs us of our divine esteem. Because we are all born with, with a good amount of esteem in us as babies. Babies have esteem. Babies are born confident. They feel like they own the world. A baby doesn't know what class of society their parents belong to. A baby feels like it can go out and grab anything. It feels like it has the right to anything. A baby would feel confident entering any building. It doesn't feel like there's anywhere out of his or her reach. That is the divine esteem that God has given all of us. What we see in babies, in toddlers, in children. It's unfortunate that over time we begin to teach children to lower their esteem and to see that things are out of their reach and to believe that they belong to a particular class and they have nothing to do with the other classes. We are the ones that teach children restriction in expression. So I'll be talking about three things that reduce our esteem, that we engage in, that kills our divine esteem. That esteem that God has given you from birth. The first thing that we do that reduces our esteem as people is begging. The act of begging reduces your divine esteem. We were not created to beg. The human being wasn't created to beg. Because begging goes again and not, goes not just against your divine esteem, which is an internal gift. It goes against an external gift of divine supply. And what that means is that there's more supply in this world than there is demand. I'll say that again. The law of divine supply means that there's more supply of resources in this world than there is demand. It doesn't matter what any statistics tell you. That is how the world operates. There is more supply of a resource than there is demand. That's how God works. More supply. The sun gives out more heat than 
he can deal with. There is more heat that the sun can give out than what we are receiving, than what we can ever demand of the sun. If the sun was to give us the full amount of heat that it's capable of, we will not survive it. We would we will be scorched by the heat. What that means is if we were if we were to take all the supply in the world, all the divine supply, and have access to it, we would practically drown in it. There are more natural resources in the world than we could ever, ever dig up or use up. More. There is more water in the world than we could ever drink if everyone was to drink a gallon of water a day. There's more water in the world. There's more air in the world than we could breathe in. So there is a law of divine supply. Just that we've been taught, just like we teach kids to lose their esteem, we've been taught to believe that there is no supply, that there is less supply and more demand, but it's not true. That's why I would say the human being wasn't created to beg. Because begging for resources ridicules the law of divine supply. It ridicules the law of divine supply. There's always enough. The problem is when you are in a situation when, where you find yourself begging, the issue is always we are fixated on one chain of supply at the expense of other chains and channels of supply. So when someone begs and begs for money, What always comes to my mind is the fact that this person is being blindsided to other things. So you see people beg. It's very common in a part of Nigeria that I stay in. You see a lot of people beg. They're on the street, side of the road, begging. So people walk, walk around begging. And that's why you kind of look at them and you're like, oh, for some of them, the divine supply of good health and a functional body, they are totally blindsided to it. It's like, I need this money, I don't have the money in my pocket. But then they've forgotten that they have the energy, the strength, the good health, the perfect body to go out there and say, can I do this work? Can I read your compound? I remember there was a day I was in my house and someone knocked my gate and it was a young man and um, he told he asked me is there anything I can do for you and at, at first I was trying to get I was being get impatient because he kind of stopped me from something I was doing inside the house and I just came out and I thought it was a vista for me but then he says is there something I can do for you and um, impulsively I said no there's nothing I don't I don't have anything for you to do for me and I was about to close the gate and he said, look, this your, this your lawn is pretty bushy. Can I cut the grass? And I looked at the lawn and it was quite bushy. And he said, this is pretty bushy. The snakes can hide in here and stuff like that. And I said, all right, cut the grass. And he cut the grass. And by the time I came out, a lot of people that would normally cut the grass would cut it in such a way that they cut out a lot of, you know, it's it's so it's so terribly done that a lot of the a lot of the even the good flowers are taken out and stuff like that. But they are done it in such a neat way. It was incredibly done. I've never seen anybody do it that way before. And um and I and I saw he didn't have any 
any implements, no cutlass, no nothing. He did it with his hands, just took out the weeds and stuff, and, and he, he pretty much just tended the front of my house. He tended it. And the whole place looked really good, really neat. He had taken the grass and thrown it away somewhere. And um, I was very impressed. And I asked him if he would come into my house and do the same thing. And he came into the compound and he did the same thing around the compound. And then I said, how much do I pay you for this? And he asked how much I was willing to pay him. And um, I paid him some amount of money because I was really impressed. And he was thankful. And I said, and I asked him for his phone number. He said he didn't have a phone. I said, I would like him to come back and do the same thing again in a few weeks. And he said he would, he would come back. And in like two, three weeks again, he came back and he did the same thing. And I gave him more to do this time. And what I paid him increased. And now he comes back every once in a while and we have a relationship. And he has been able to get a phone and I have his phone number now. You see, at that point, he didn't have money, but he was in good supply of energy. He was in very good shape, very good shape. And he knew that he was in good supply of energy. You see, that divine supply is always there. But a lot of times, we get so tunneled vision on one channel. And not only did that guy not just get a handout, he has gotten a steady gig that it comes every single time. And every single time, he's always saying, I can do this thing. I can wash your tank. I can do this. And now there is trust. And now I wait for him to come. You see, his esteem was not battered. His esteem was improved. Because he was able to link in to that channel of divine supply of energy of good health, of strength that he had, even though he didn't have money. And he converted that supply to money. So before you beg, think about divine supply. What are you divinely supplied with that is in abundance? We all have it that you could offer. Because begging kills your esteem. Now, the second thing I will talk about that kills our esteem as people is borrowing. Borrowing. And it's also something that is very common in today's world. We go around borrowing things, borrowing money, asking people to give us money for a particular period of time that we'll get to pay back. Now, the truth is that most of us listening to this podcast have borrowed one time or the other. I've borrowed. And then there are some things you could borrow that are like innocuous things. You could borrow someone's pen because you're in a bank, you know. You're, you're, you're somewhere, you need to fill a form or sign something. You don't have a pen. You borrow their pen and give it back to them. That's okay. But then let's talk about borrowing money. A lot of people's lies have been turned upside down because of this act of borrowing. A lot of people's esteem has been battered because of this act of borrowing. And borrowing kills the internal gift of esteem. And it kills the internal gift of esteem because it tampers with an external gift also called the gift of divine timing whenever people borrow it's either because they have missed an opportunity or they want to jump the line and go ahead of a particular timing so what I mean is when we, are, when we borrow, it kind of says we don't have this thing for now. And that says that it's either you had an opportunity to have it that you missed or you want to go ahead of your time of having it to have it at the time when you want. 
And I believe that nature, there is what we call divine timing for every single thing. There's a timing for every single thing. A timing for every single thing. And divine timing can be very hard because a lot of times it doesn't, it is not the kind of timing that you can use a date or a clock to watch. It's not guided by a clock or a calendar. It's guided by God's divine wisdom. For which there is no clock and there is no calendar. A lot of times. But we need to trust that it is there. Although there are some things that God has revealed his timing for, but even with that, it's not very rigid. Just like with childbirth. The divine timing for childbirth when a woman gets pregnant is nine months. But sometimes it does take longer. Sometimes it's shorter. But there is a timing to it. However, there is a divine timing also for the ability for a couple to be able to have a child. I'm not talking about birth right now, but to come together and through intercourse, they are able to fertilize an egg and then it becomes a child. Now that timing is not as rigid as that of pregnancy, the gestation period of pregnancy. That has always been sealed from man. But there is a timing. So you see some people after a year of marriage, they have a child. Some people after two years. Some people after four. Some people after seven. Some people after ten. Some people after fifteen. You see, there's a timing. Now, a lot of times we go and borrow because we do not believe there is divine timing for things. And that's why borrowing reduces our esteem in the sense that borrowing puts us in a position where we become slaves to the lender. Borrowing puts you in a position where you become a slave to the lender. Now, the lender might be an incredibly kind person, doesn't mean to make you feel like a slave, but your mind tells you, I owe this person. So when someone lends you stuff, even when they do things that do not please you, you kind of believe that, ah, man, I really can't tell this person my mind right now because I owe him something. Unless I'm willing to pay him right now, I can't, be, I can't offend this person or even correct this person. I must watch my words around this person so you cannot be yourself because the lender owes, owes you, owns you. The lender owns you at that point in time. He owns your ability to express. Because if he feels your ability, your expression is offensive, it can cause a strain on the relationship and he can ask for what he has given you before the time. And if you don't have it, then you're in trouble. And that's the position borrowing puts you in. A lot of times when we borrow, we borrow because we are grossly optimistic. And that's because our not having puts us in a position where we believe that we can control what happens in the future. So we say, oh, give me this amount of money, I'll pay you back at a particular time. But a lot of times we don't know what will happen between when we borrow the money and when we have committed ourselves to pay back. And when it doesn't happen by that time, you find yourself evading or trying to evade your lender. And that controls where you can go, what you can do, and that in itself affects your esteem. 
So the act of boring goes against the law of divine timing. Divine timing. A lot of times when people approach me to lend them money, because they're going to use money, because there are a lot of things people could ask you to lend them, but I, I would say one of the things that really gets people's esteem battered is the borrowing of money. I always ask them, are you sure you need it? I want you to go back and think about this thing for a day or two and think about whether you really need to do this thing now. Because a lot of times borrowing comes from, I need this thing now. So people will say, oh, I want to borrow, I need a car, I need to buy a car. I need to make up money to buy a car. This person wants to sell a car and they just need 200,000 more to sell this car to me and I don't have 200,000 before this offer gets off. So you feel that car, that timing for the car is the best timing for you to have a car. So you go and you borrow. I've had too many people who will say, oh, I want to have this opportunity to get a house. And um, they're just asking for me to pay the first year rent right now and I made some money but then I need 500,000 more. 500,000 more to borrow so I can get this house now. It's always about what you want now. But then, you must think of the, like the case of pregnancy or gestation. It's not about what the woman wants. Because a lot of times, when you get to that five, six month mark, the woman is almost ready to come out with this baby because then it's, it's affecting your sleep, it's affecting, every, it's affecting everything. You get, you're kind of tired. Get to the five, six months, seven months, eight months. It's not about what you want now. I remember when we had our first child. She took a while. You know I mean, not not months, but a couple of extra weeks before she finally decided she was ready to come out. But then I remember those extra weeks felt like for my wife, oh, can this baby just come out now? So she would go for walks. Try to walk up the stairs, come down, walk up the stairs, you know, just anything to just trigger that timing to be when she wanted it to be because it was getting uncomfortable, but it didn't happen till it, the divine timing was right. The same thing when you feel you have to borrow to buy that car now, to rent that house now, to get that phone now, to get that deal for that shoe now. You got to think, do I really need to have it now? So the remedy to borrowing is to be able to let go of your timing and say, I can't do this thing now. I can't do it now. A lot of organizations have entrapped people by telling them, oh, you might not have the money now, but then we can we'll help you, you can finance it. You can finance it. We will take the money from you for the next two years, for the next 10 years. And then the next 10 years comes and then you are laid off work or you have a sickness that stops you from working. But then you have the lender coming to you and knocking on your door every once in a while. And then that batters your esteem as a person because you become a slave. So before you borrow, always think about it. It's incredible how many people I tell them to go. Just pause, go away. Because when we pause, we tend to make the best decisions. When we just take some time to pause from our impulses, you'll be, you'll be, you, you'll be shocked how much clarity would come into your life. So I always tell people, go Go, go and take a night or two nights and just come back and tell me if you really feel you need this car right now. And a lot of times they come back and say, you know what, I, I realize hmm, I don't really need it. I don't really need it. Like, I can't afford it. I'm not even sure if I can pay back this 200k I was asking you for. So, yeah. A lot of them come to their senses and realize that the timing isn't right. And because the supply is there the right timing at the right timing these things will come to you so that's about borrowing the third thing that affects our esteem as people 
it's probably going to be the most controversial thing that people don't expect to hear. But I truly believe it affects our esteem because I spent a lot of years doing this thing. And it's business. The act of business. I know a lot of people say business. How does business affect your esteem? But it does. Business is one of those things that can be a blessing and a curse. And I truly, I've truly come to believe that business can be a blessing and a curse. Because when we do business, I've seen a lot of people do business. And, and when they started, they were pretty cool, decent, kind people. But then 10 years later of running what we see as a successful business, you can see the change. You can see that they've changed into cruel, insensitive, greedy people. I've, I've actually seen it in people. I've seen that transformation into monsters that business can easily turn you into. That's the truth. Business can easily turn you into a monster. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very deadly tool. It's like a gun. It can be used for good and it can be used for an incredible amount of, of harm. So business is the third thing. Business can kill your esteem as a person. It can. If you spend too long in that spell of business, it can affect your esteem. And that's because business goes against an external rule called the law of divine value. And what that means is that everything that is created whether externally or, or internally, outside of us or inside of us, is of incredible value that money cannot buy. Every single thing. Every single thing that we try to trade in reality has so much value beyond money. So when you trade paper, Paper is made from wood. Wood is a natural gift. You cannot make wood. You are not the creator of wood. You can't make it. It's beyond your ability to make. So you can't put a price on it. You can't make it. You can't make water. You can't make water. You can, you can go about a process of purifying water, but that very thing, that very core constituent called water in your product, you can't make it. You didn't make it. You can't make air. You can make an air conditioner, but you can't make the air. That's the very vital element through which the air conditioner can be enjoyed. You can sell food, but you can't make that crop. That maize, that beans, that rice, that wheat, you can't make it. It's beyond your ability. So you can't put a value on it. Very hard. Those internal things, your ability to sing, you can't. You can't make yourself sing. You don't even know how it's done. That your voice box, you don't know. Your lung capacity, you don't know. You don't know how. You were born with this gift. Your ability to create and draw and think and write. You can't. Your gift for mathematics, you can't make it. So a lot of times in business, we sell things that we cannot truly make. We put a value on things that we cannot truly value. And when you spend time trading something for which you can't value, if you sell it for what seems to be a reasonably high price, there's a tendency that over time you begin to feel like a thief. Deep within you. 
you feel like a thief. And that's why you see people that run very successful businesses, a lot of times there's a guilt within them. Some, some, some guilt. A lot of them might not express it publicly, but there is a guilt. Leads them to say, oh, well, how can we do something charitable? How can we have a charitable arm to this? There's a guilt that comes when, it, when, when you are selling something for which you really don't know. You, you know within yourself that you, you really don't know why you have it or how you got it. You see football players. They give their money away. Basketball players, you know, just saying, oh, how can I, how can I, how can I help here? Because they know within themselves my ability to play football or play basketball or do any sports. I really don't know. I really don't know why I have this incredible gift. I cannot really say it's my training because I train with other people. I train with other people. I played on the streets of my neighborhood with other people. They weren't as special as I am. That divine value always kicks in. It's not mine. I'm just a steward. It's not mine. The other end is when you trade something that has divine value and you don't get paid a lot for it. You feel like a fool. Because you know that this thing is divinely valued. You know, I know I'm so creative. I know this thing is incredible. And then you take this divine value and someone is paying a pittance for it. So you feel like a fool. So, one thing that can happen is that business can make you feel, number one, the guilt of amassing so much for which you truly do not own or from which you truly do not own. Or the gift, or the, 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 the self deprecation of knowing you have this incredible thing for which others around you do not place that value on. So one will get you sad from feeling like you are enriching yourself or gorging yourself from something that was freely given to you. And one gets you sad from knowing the value of what you have and feeling like if You are not being a good enough steward of it, allowing the light to shine enough. That's the biggest problem with business. I've talked to people running businesses on different skills. And on those two skills, you see people, you hardly see anyone that is not on one of those skills. Just feeling like if nobody believes in the, in the value of what they have, and there are some other people that just feel like if what they have, they don't truly, truly deserve it. And they're thinking of, how can we, how can I find a balance in giving this thing back? But we must be careful when it comes to business. Because the law of divine value is probably one of the greatest laws there is to make us know that all things were given to us as a stewardship to serve to share, to bless. Now, am I saying don't do business? No. I'm just saying we should get to a point in our lives where we do less and less and less of business. Do less. You must do less. You must cut down on it. And, and what this means is that that's how life operates with some things. Just like you know how a, for a child, it's okay for a child to eat sugar. It's okay because the child walks off that sugar. The child can eat sugar. You understand? They have a sugar rush and they run around the house and before you know they burnt off all the, all the sugar, all the calories in sugar. It's dangerous for an adult to eat that amount of sugar because they can't burn it off anymore. Just by virtue of your strength, you can't do it that much anymore. So a seven-year-old can eat an amount of sugar that a 70-year-old should never eat. A seven-year-old can eat an amount of meat that a 70-year-old should abstain from. 
So meat is not bad. But you must be able to cut down on meat the older you get. The same thing with business. The same thing with business. It gets to a point where you do business and it meets your needs around you. It meets your needs. It's good. It's a tool. That's why I say it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. But as you keep going, keep amassing more, it's like feeding a gremlin. It's getting bigger. At the point in time, the business was so small. You could control it. You could control it. You could tell it, sit down, stand up, go to bed. Then you feed it, feed it, start getting clients. It gets to be the same size with you. You can tell it, you can negotiate with it. Please go and sit down. Please go to bed. Please do this. And then you feed it and feed it. Then it becomes a giant. And then it begins to tell you what to do. And that's the dangerous part of it. There must be a point where you stop that thing from being a giant. And I'll, I'll read a book called Stolen Focus. Um, and it's a great book. And it's part of it where the author is talking about... Um, the author is talking about tech companies in Silicon Valley and how they know that a lot of their um, platforms and sites is killing people's attention. People's ability to focus in life is beginning to kill it. They realize that their platforms, their technology is killing our ability as human beings to focus. It's killing our esteem, our view of ourselves. They know. But then the business model is stopping them from doing the right thing to this technology from letting it affect the evolution of humans into more productive people. So people that are running Instagram, Facebook, you know, Twitter, they know that these platforms, as much as they give us information, is causing a lot of um, a negative emotional states in people, causing a lot of depression, causing a lot of lack of focus, you know, causing a lot of materialism in people. They know. But then, because of because this, these businesses have become giants, they can't stop them anymore. They cannot, they, cannot, they cannot tweak those businesses anymore to make human beings better and have better emotions and better values. They can't because it's making too much money right now. So the business has become a monster. And now the business is telling them what to do. So now they are employees to their business. They are no longer the owners. The business now own them, owns them. And that's the thing with business. So these people, a lot of them are millionaires, but they're incredibly sad because they see what their businesses are doing. They see what it's doing to the world. They see how it's destroying people and destroying nations, destroying families, causing suicide. They know. They see it. It's killing their esteem on the inside. That's how business can kill your esteem. So business, we must be careful. So how can we stop business from growing into a monster? Is that it gets to a place where you look at the size and you stop feeding it every day. You cannot allow a business to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and collect and collect money. And, you know, that's what business feeds on, on transactions every single time. So you grow to a point. A point where I've decided to grow to right now. By doing a few things. Number one, when you when when you grow in your business, you've been doing your business ten years or so, you must get to a point where you now begin to say, I am not going to charge for every single thing. So some people come to you and then you decide you are going to offer it to them. And what I mean is someone approached me some days back and said they want me to come and train their staff. And um, yeah, I told them I could do it. They asked, they asked how long it was going to take and um, how much it was going to cost. Now, the business part of me was going to say, okay, I'll prepare a document and I'll send it to you because I already had a price in my mind. I'll prepare a document and send it to you. But then I, immediately I said, okay, for me, I want to do less business. So instead of telling them that, I said, you know what? 
What is your budget? How much do you have budgeted for this thing? And they said they have X amount. And what they had was lower than what I was going to charge. It was lower. But then, you know, I realized at that point, it was my opportunity to tell business, sit down. At this day, I want to tell business, sit down, go to bed, go and wash the dishes. So I told them, let's do it. Because I enjoy doing this thing, number one. It's given to me as a gift. The gift of wisdom, to train, to speak. It's a gift. And if that's what you can give me, I will be grateful. And at that point, that transaction became less of a charge and more of an honorarium. So I was like, that is what you can honor me with. I will take it. That was me taking control of the business. Taking control of it. Telling it, sit down. Even though deep in me, I wanted to write that quote for them. I had to say, I want to do less of business and I want to express more freely and be honored. And what that honor means sometimes is, sometimes it might be a particular amount, sometimes it might be food, sometimes it might be data, sometimes it might be a shirt. But you know, I want to open myself up to those gifts and not particularly, mm, this is what I charge. This is my business model. Because a lot of times, what happens is when you charge and the client says it's too expensive, we feel offended. We feel put down. That how dare this person say what I'm giving is too expensive. That's part of the esteem beating. And when that happens repeatedly, you kind of begin to feel like you are not making good decisions. They are not feeding this business well. So you are a bad parent to this business. So sometimes you need to let go of that rigidity of this is my quotation. This is how much you must pay me up front. Another thing you need to do if you are a business person listening to this and you've grown your business to a place whereby you've got steady clients and you know that your business is taking care of things around you. Sometimes you don't need to think and look around and say, who are the people I can serve for free? Remember, divine value. Whatever it is, if you look at the very element, it was given to you freely. Whatever product it is, whatever service it is, if it's a service by your skill, it was given freely. And you got to take some time every month, twice a month, look for people that need this thing and give it to them. Just say, I'm choosing your institution. I'm a designer. I'm going to give you guys, I can see your logo. Would you like to change your logo? I'm willing to do it for you for free. They ask why. You tell them, we do this every month for two businesses and we've seen what you're doing. We want to reward it. Give it for free. The one thing you can do is ask people, what do you have? And let them honor you with what they have. What will happen is they will pray for you some more. And they will be thankful. Another thing you can do is offer it to people. That on a good day will never be able to access you. And give it to them for free. You don't need to start with 20 people. You can start with one person a month. You can start with two people every six months. It goes a long way. It gives you the ability to tell your business. Sit down. And that raises your esteem. Because it knows, you now know that you are trading divine value as a steward, not as, a, not as an owner. Very important. And I hope people are able to understand these three things I've talked about. Business, a borrowing, and begging. If you do not put these things in the right perspective, they will kill the greatest gift you have, which is your esteem. 